Facebook releases textless NLP, Roomba learns to avoid poop, and Jürgen Schmidhuber invented every single thing there is. Welcome to ML News, it's a great Monday. All right, let me show you something. Come here, watch this. See, this is one, two, three, four boxes by Kevin. What do these boxes contain? Check it out. It says, Kevin, notes, do not throw away. And inside you'll just find like a giant stack of papers. There's four of these boxes. This note-taking system works well for people like Kevin, who is an, an organized and diligent and conscientious person, but I'm not. I could not do this and still know what's going on in my research. And luckily I don't have to because uh, there's weights and biases. That's exactly for people like me who cannot manage to keep up some sort of a manual organized system. Weights and biases tracks everything for me pretty much automatically and always lets me know what's going on in my research. Be that for hyperparameter optimization or within my data set or just as a log for myself or for other people in form of a weights and biases report. So if you are amazed how people can do this, and if you're like me and are absolutely unable to do so, maybe give weights and biases a try because it's an absolute game changer if you are a disorganized mess. And yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say to that. Check it out and see ya. Hello and welcome to ML News on this glorious Monday. Let's dive into our first story. A popular ML YouTuber has just reached 100,000 subscribers. This historic milestone means that he's probably going to get the silver play button by YouTube, which is one of the highest achievements one can reach in life. Now here at ML News, we are unbiased. We are neither pro nor con this individual, but legend says that the paper review videos have been lacking recently. And also rumors are that his mother is a hamster and his father smells of elderberries. Be my weasel. ML News has not been able to confirm or reject this story, but we'll keep track of it. Okay, first real story, Facebook AI releases a blog post on textless NLP, generating expressive speech from raw audio. This is essentially a language model that goes directly from sound to sound. So previous works in these domains have always first translated the sound into text and then continued the text and generated the sound again from that. But Facebook has released three successive papers that do away with the text altogether, going directly from the sound wave to generating more sound. And not only that, but they're able to do this while capturing things like the speaker's identity and the sort of intonation and rhythm of the language. They do this unsurprisingly by using a VQVAE based system that teases apart these individual things in the input signal. So the system is specifically designed for speech and that makes it really good at, for example, compressing speech. So what you do is you'd simply transmit once your speaker identity vector and then you transmit the latent information that the model captures about you to the receiver receiver, which is then able to reconstruct your speech, including intonation, rhythm, and so on. So the system naturally doesn't have an idea of what a token is in the language. So it works with what it calls expressive units. The expressive units are something like tokens or syllables, but the model can essentially decide by itself what they are. So as I understand it, one expressive unit might be pa and the other one might be ba and so on. Now this opens up a lot of possibility. You can imagine taking a piece of speech and changing its rhythm, changing its intonation, changing its content, changing the speaker's identity while keeping the rhythm and content. But also these act as real language models. So you can give a prefix spoken word and then have the model continue that without the model ever having trained on text. So they have some cool demonstrations. In fact, there's an entire website of demonstrations but it is attendant from the people to defend himself, from this information pride of the potential, 
in criminal activity, curiosity, and impetuosity of the world were soon acquired. And the model, depending on the temperature, is capable of generating something that actually sounds like real speech. So this is exciting because it fulfills the end-to-end -end mentality that deep learning promises. And it pushes this to this new domain of speech without using the intermediate text representation. So hopefully this will kick off an entirely new research direction and we're excited to see what happens. Next news, Jürgen Schmidhuber released a new blog post called The Most Cited Neural Networks All Build on Work Done in My Labs. It's a relatively short blog post that goes through sort of the current state of the art models and he tries to argue that all of them somehow come from work that he's done. Undoubtedly, Jürgen Schmidhuber has had his fingers into a lot of research and some of these claims are actually true in the sense that it happened more than once probably that he or people under his supervision came up with ideas that were a little bit before their time and then other people adopted these ideas or refined them and became much more successful with them. Now that being said, he tends to push it a little bit too far. For example, he's been long claiming that his artificial curiosity principles is essentially GANs in a nutshell. Whereas the general consensus is that it's not like an obvious application of his ideas. And most recently claiming that fast weight programmers are essentially precursors to transformers. Now this can be shown for a type of linear transformer or linear attention mechanism, but that's essentially a recurrent neural network. But again, to see transformers as sort of the incarnation of his ideas is a little bit too far. Now in terms of the bigger picture, I've always appreciated Schmidhuber for for sort of being the force that tries to do justice to everyone that tries to cite correctly and so on. But I'm not sure, like a blog post called the most cited neural networks all built on work done in my labs <laughs> might be pushing it a little far. But then what convinced me that this is all correct is definitely, definitely the guns here. Like check this, got nothing on this. We do a flexing contest. Uh. This can be the thumbnail now. <laughs> this is a good thumbnail. <laughs> no, he smiles. So I need better light. In any case, I don't know what to make of this. I don't know who is served by a blog post like this. Maybe it's just meant as a little bit of an outlet for himself. But it's a free world, so who am I to tell him? The Wall Street Journal ran an investigation into how TikTok's algorithm works. Essentially what they've done is they've created a lot of fake profiles that went out and just watched videos of a specific type of content according to the hashtags of that content. And then they measured how fast the algorithm picked up on their interests. And they found that the algorithm extremely quickly rabbit holed the individual users into their preferred type of content, which in this case, they give the example of depression and mental health related content sort of reinforcing all of that and then the few videos in between that are not that are a lot of advertisements and every now and then kind of a video where the algorithm tries to break you out of this cycle TikTok is especially good at this probably because the medium of short videos lends itself a lot combined with the interface it can measure how long you watch each video and then serve you more content according to that so the Wall Street Journal also so interviews a advocate for algorithm transparency who explains a little bit what's going on. And if you're interested, I invite you to check out this article. So what it seems to be is that the TikTok algorithm is essentially the YouTube algorithm on steroids. And we've also seen YouTube become more and more crappy over the years. And by crappy, I mean that they've apparently traded off what drives engagement versus the user experience on the site. Now, I know that makes no sense. Like, how can your user experience be worse, yet you engage more with the content, but that's what seems to be happening. Now, in the old days of YouTube, the sidebar next to a video actually contained relevant videos to the one you were currently watching. There were video responses and other things on that topic, and increasingly, it's just become more and more recommendation engine crap 
crap. Like, yes, I know I generally watch PewDiePie's videos, but now I want to watch videos about how car engines work. Please give me stuff related to that. And YouTube seemed to have more and more just loaded me with what it knows that I generally like. Now, there are some signs that in recent times they've changed that up a little bit, which is a good thing. But I definitely miss the old days where you could just sort of get lost in a topic by just clicking videos on the sidebar. But safe to say these algorithms are a difficult topic. There's way too much content, so there has to be some kind of an algorithm. And of course, these platforms, they want to make money. So it's natural that they would serve you the thing that you engage with most. But I do agree with the person that Wall Street Journal interviews here. And that is that we often don't have enough transparency in what happens behind these algorithms, why a particular thing surfaced and what you can do to change it. CNN Business writes, the new iteration of Roomba uses AI to avoid smearing poop all over your house. So apparently this is a big problem that people have when using their Roomba that it catches feces of pets and then just runs with it all across the house. Now, interestingly, this seems to be a very hard problem. So the company iRobot, uh, the company behind the Roomba, has spent years collecting data related to poop. So they have had real poop photos sent to them, but they also model all kinds of fake poop. They bought apparently all the funny fake poop that you can find on the internet, and they made hundreds of Play-Doh poop models. And now they've trained the onboard camera that was already trained to avoid obstacles to also recognize feces and steer around them. And they're so confident in that system that they said they'll replace any of the new Roombas if they actually do catch poop. So who said AI couldn't be used to make the world better? Excellent development. The NVIDIA blog has an article called An AI for Fine Art. Attorney trains NVIDIA RTX 2070 to authenticate masterpieces. Now, the NVIDIA article is based on this article in IEEE Spectrum titled This AI Can Spot an Art Forgery. So this is about how an amateur, a lawyer by training, trained a convolutional neural network to distinguish between real and fake drawings. So essentially, the tough part was collecting the data set, of course. And for that, he and his wife collected numerous paintings by particular artists but then also paintings by their students and by people trying to imitate their styles. And they essentially trained a classifier to distinguish patches of the real images and patches of the other images. Big part of the article is devoted on how to select the patches that you train on. And the solution that this person came up with is to look at the entropy of a particular image patch and only include image patches with high enough entropy. The result is sort of a heat map that that shows which parts of an image are likely to be of the original artist and which parts of the image are unlikely to be of the original artist. So they've applied this to a data set of contested images. So they've evaluated 10 contested works and in nine of them, their system agrees with the current scholarly opinion of whether the painting is real or not. And of the one that isn't, they say that they hope that one day it will be reconsidered. And what's astounding to me is is that with such small data sets, these are a handful of or dozens of images made into small patches. So with such a small data set and a basic approach of a CNN and a heuristic of patch selection based on entropy, that this works at all. This is already astounding. It's pretty cool. But then you cannot at the same time claim that your system is good because it agrees with nine out of 10 expert opinions and then also call for that last one to be re examine because the system disagrees. Like either your system is good because the human experts are right or your system is so good that the human experts aren't right. In any case, the article details well how even an amateur can use today's deep learning methods in order to solve real world problems or at least contribute a little bit to the solution thereof. One thing that was funny, I thought, was how often the NVIDIA blog post mentions the fact that they are running a NVIDIA GPU to do this. So this is accelerated by an NVIDIA GPU. Really? 
What GPU? This GPU. And Frank reports his NVIDIA GPU dramatically speeds up their work, allowing them to train models in hours that used to take days. Time difference is just mind-boggling. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize this was NVIDIA ads. It said NVIDIA blog at the top, but you know. Business Insider writes, Inside DeepMind's secret plot to break away from Google. ML News has reported on this previously, but yet another article giving more details into how DeepMind, pretty much immediately after acquisition, already had plans to not be controlled by Google. So the article details how DeepMind wanted to set up some sort of a non-profit structure and then a cap profit structure, and then some sort of system that the AI they produce isn't controlled by Google. And the reasons they give are are things like AI ethics and who will control the AI and this shouldn't be in the possession of a single entity and blah 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 like I, I, I get it right you needed the money so you went to Google but I'm not sure how you know how acquisition works like they pay for it they get it. And I don't believe all this crap of, ooh, we want the best for humankind. No, no. You're one of the most secretive AI research labs there is. You hardly publish any models, any code. You are forced to do so for AlphaFold, but everything else is still a secret. You often publish in paywall journals. So no, I don't believe any of this. So yeah, I'm sorry, you sold your company and now it's no longer yours. In related news, Fast Company writes, ex-Googlers raise $40 million to democratize natural language AI. This is about a startup called Cohere and apparently has the backing of Jeffrey Hinton and Fei Fei Li. And much like a lot of others of these startups, it promises to democratize AI to give more people access to it and so on. So on their website, you can sign up for the waitlist to their API, but it seems that it's essentially the same same as many of the other language model APIs, where they have the model and they let you use it according to their terms of service. And how exactly that is different, I'm not entirely sure yet. The register writes, only natural persons can be recognized as patent inventors, not AI systems, a US judge rules. So this is an addendum to a story that we've previously covered about Stephen Toller getting a patent on an invention that his AI has invented. So he's the owner, but the AI is listed as the inventor. And this has been accepted in South Africa and Australia, as far as I can remember. But now a US judge has rejected rejected the patent in the US. And the reason seems to be that the computer program doesn't fit the definition of an individual that must take an oath to swear that they are the inventor on a patent application. Toller on his side says he wants to continue to fight for inventor rights of his machines, primarily to prevent humans from stealing ideas generated by computers and taking all the credit. If there was ever a first world problem, I guess this is one. In a Q&A, Sam Altman said apparently that GPT-4 will remain text only. It will be apparently not much bigger than GPT-3, but a lot more compute will have gone into it. He claims that it's astounding how far you can get with simply using more compute and doing smarter things. GPT-4, therefore, will be a more powerful language model, but not necessarily larger, which is good news. And maybe these techniques that OpenAI uses to make GPT-4 better can be applied to even smaller models. Though whether or not OpenAI will actually release all of these tricks is yet to be seen. Altman apparently also said that the focus right now is on a new release of Codex, which I guess OpenAI realizes is a better business case than large language models. In very related news, Salesforce releases Code T5, the code-aware encoder decoder based pre-trained programming language models. Shouldn't this say model? Yeah, here it says model, see? So this is a version of T5 that is specifically trained on code. And even more specifically, it is trained on a bunch of subtasks around code. So next to the masked span predictions, which you know from language model, there's also masked identifier prediction where the model needs to come up with essentially variable names. There is identifier tagging, there is generation. You can generate descriptions from code and code from descriptions. And all of this 
this results in a model that is very good on these code generation tasks. So there's a lot of things happening in bringing language model into the world of coding and it's looking out to be an exciting time. And the cool thing is code and pre-trained models are available. Some helpful things I've come across this week. DeepMind releases their reinforcement learning lecture series. This is a series of YouTube videos along with slides that you can watch and download. And they take you from zero to hero on reinforcement learning, starting off with exploration and control and MDPs and ending on deep reinforcement learning. So if you've always wanted to get into RL, this is a very up-to-date resource to do so. Also DeepMind releases the Wikigraphs dataset along with tools to download it. Now, haven't I complained earlier that DeepMind releases nothing? I might want to tone down that criticism a little bit. So here's a repo that lets you download the Wikigraphs dataset, which links Wikipedia articles to free base entries. And the hope is that people will develop new language models and methodologies that make use of the graph structures of how these entities are linked together. Another cool dataset is the LiveCell dataset, which is a large scale dataset for label free live cell segmentations. So this is a big data set for segmenting cells in these microscopy images. Very cool. Check it out. And lastly, a cool library called SpeechBrain, a PyTorch powered speech toolkit that helps you with various tasks around speech processing if you're interested in that. All K-pop rights. Social media influencer model created from artificial intelligence lands 100 sponsorships. So this is about Rosie, which is this avatar right here. Now, I'm not exactly sure. I think Rosie is like a 3D model that they render into real pictures. Not entirely sure how it works. But given that this looks a little bit like current Pixar movies, but the backgrounds look relatively real, I think that's what's happening. So there's a company behind Rosie and they sell Rosie as a model. So you can book Rosie and Rosie will do advertisements for you. The CEO says the reason for the popularity of virtual humans is that there is no fear that advertisements will be suspended due to unsavory privacy scandals after the AI model is selected as the advertising model. Also, the virtual model is not limited in time and space, unlike real people. Now you just wait for that. The way AI is currently progressing pretty soon will have scandals involving not real people, but AIs. Well, I guess we have that right now already, so you know. Okay, it's time for news questions, which is where I answer questions asked by the news without reading the article. Here we go. Forbes asks, artificial intelligence, should you teach it to your employees? No. Mind Matters asks, isn't it time for an artificial intelligence reality check? No. Fortune asks, did DeepMind just make a big step towards more human-like AI? No. Forbes asks, is artificial intelligence set to take over the art industry? No. CNBC asks, are our fears of artificial intelligence justified? No. KCRW asks, can Alexa tackle the meaning of life? No. TechCrunch asks, AI as a service to solve your business problems? Nope. And Forbes again asks, how do we use artificial intelligence ethically? Probably the same way you use a knife. Just don't stab anyone with it. Our final news for today, The Verge writes, automated hiring software is mistakenly rejecting millions of viable job candidates. So the article describes a new report from Harvard Business School saying that a lot of people who would match a job description are screened out by AI. Now, rather than this being a big criticism of these systems, I think this is a big cry for the use of technology. It seems like most of the errors that these systems make are because they're just not good enough and because they work on like stupid handcrafted rules like it searches for exact matches of certain skills in the CVs of applicants rather than considering synonyms of these skills or it has hard filters like if you've had a certain time of pause between your employments then you're automatically screened out rather than going into the reason why you had to pause during that time. But I think there's a lot of potential here to make technology more accurate in order to 
help these companies make hiring easier. And they need it. It's not like they do this just to save money. The article details this saying that in the early 2010s, the average corporate job posting attracted 120 applicants. But by the end of the decade, this figure had risen to 250 applicants per job. So it's not like this is a problem that you could just easily solve by doing it yourself. It's not like a lot of these companies are lazy. It's just that the amount of data they'd have to analyze manually is just too much. And even if you let humans do it, if you just overwhelm humans with giant amounts of applications, they're going to do exactly the same thing. Well, this person's skill doesn't exactly match. Out. Well, this person had some unexplained break. Out. I don't have time to research why this happened. So I think the potential for machines to improve and deliver a better service here is pretty good and probably one of the better shots we have at solving this problem rather than just dooming all hiring technology altogether. I'm not saying there aren't problems with these kinds of technologies, just saying we could make them more useful. Cool, that was it for ML News. Thank you so much for watching, subscribing, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.